Okay, thanks a lot for inviting me. So I'd like to start first with the outline of the talk. Um, we will work in the setting of uh, the cylinder and we are interested into closed exact Lagrangians L and L prime. And the goal is to understand the Lagrangian Hopper metric a bit better. So in the second part of the talk, um, I, I'll explain how to associate to L and L prime a barcode. And we will extract from this barcode a few invariants. So one of them is gamma, the spectral metric, and the betas are the length of the finite bars in the barcode. And the main result will um, be about an, an upper bound of the Lagrangian Hofer metric in terms of the beta chase and gamma. And the proof will then uh, go um, using induction and to apply induction, we will remove the smallest bar. Okay, so first about the setting. Uh, once again, we work in the unit cotangent bundle of S1. I just call it the cylinder. And the Lagrangian submanifolds L and L prime are assumed to be Hamiltonian isotopic to the zero section, and they should intersect transversely. So in this picture, uh, this should be a, a cylinder where the right, the, the left side and the right side, they are glued together. Um, the black L is the zero section and the blue Lagrangian L prime uh, is just another Lagrangian. The Lagrangian Hopper metric we'd like to understand is defined by infamizing the oscillation norm of all Hamiltonians H that map L so, so that the time one flow, which is generated by H, maps L to L prime. So now about um, persistence for the homology, this is the general pipeline of how it works. We take a pair of Lagrangians, L and L prime, as before, and we apply Flores theory to it. And this will allow us to construct a so-called persistence for the homology, which is a persistence module. And then the structure theorem uh, for persistence modules of finite type allows us to extract um, the barcode which is a multi-set of intervals. And the goal of the talk is to find an upper bound for Hofer's metric between L and L prime in terms of invariance that we extract from the barcode. So in the next few slides, I'd like to outline how to construct the barcode. So the first step is to set up FLIR theory. So uh, recall that the FLIR complex um, for the pair L and L prime is generated by the intersection point between L and L prime. And we work with set two coefficients. And then the differential counts smooth orientation preserving immersions. So it's all two dimensional um, and therefore it's just combinatorial. In the picture, you see an example of um, such a blur strip. It's a flow strip from Q to P in this case. So this gives us the flow complex. It's a chain complex and we could take homology, but we are also interested into the filtration on this flow complex. And the filtration comes from an action functional. This is a functional A on the intersection point. And it should satisfy the following equation. So whenever there is a strip U from Q to P, um, the action difference between the action of Q and the action of P should be the area of the strip. So this equation uh, characterizes or determines the action functional uniquely up to shift. But we are actually not interested into um, this shift. So the barcode we will get will be defined up to shift, but this is fine with us. So here is a picture of how I think of this, this construction. On the left hand side, there is again the cylinder, and 
L is the zero section, L prime is another Lagrangian, which is a Hamiltonian isotopic to L. And then I also uh, numbered the intersection points from S1 up to S8. And then the red numbers indicate the, the area of the regions uh, which are enclosed by L and L prime. Um, okay, then this big uh, graph should be the chain complex, the, the Fleur complex between L and L prime. Um, so it encodes all the properties we need to know to write down the chain complex. We have the, in the, the generators of the chain complex, which are S1, S2, up to S8. And all these arrows indicate the existence of a strip. So for example, there is exactly one strip from S1 to S2. On the other hand, there are two strips from S1 to S8. Namely, so in the picture, one is like an upper strip, which goes up to S8. And the other one goes this along this um, thin region here. Okay, and then I also encoded the filtration on this chain complex by the height. So the height of the intersection points indicates their action level. So for example, um, the action level, the action of S1 is 15, the action of S6 is seven. So the action difference is eight. And you can check when you consider the strip from S1 to S7 uh, to S6, it has area exactly six plus two, which is eight. So this corresponds to our rule for, for the action function. Now, now that we have the filter chain complex, uh, we could take persistence homology and look at the structure theorem and see how to define the barcode. Um, instead of going through this procedure, I just um, want to give you some properties of the barcode. So first of all, a barcode consists of finitely many intervals ij, and they can be of two possible types. There are finite bars, which are half open intervals, they are H A B J, and there are infinite bars, um, which are like start at finite value and go on up to infinity. Now, assuming that all action values are distinct, I'd like to list some properties of the barcode B of L L prime, and this will be the barcode that we associate to L and L prime. Now, first of all, the number of infinite bars should be the rank of the homology of L. Um, this is two in our case. Secondly, the endpoints of the bars should be precisely the action values. And now the third point tells you for any intersection point Q, so Q is a generator of our flow complex, the action value of Q will correspond to an endpoint of a bar. And it will correspond to a lower end of a bar if and only if its boundary is actually already a boundary in the chain complex, which is generated by intersection points of lower action. So let us quickly look at an example. So this is the same situation as before. We have the same filter the chain complex. And this time I have on the right the barcode which is associated to it. So you see we have two infinite bars. So one starting by the action of S8 and one starts at the action of S1. And we have three finite bars and all the endpoints of the bars are at action levels. Uh, moreover, if you look at, for example, let's take S8, and we would like to, to see why, whether the action of S8 corresponds to a lower end or an upper end of a interval, you have to consider the boundary of S8. And the boundary of S8 is S7. And S7 is also the boundary 
of S2 plus S4. So in particular, S7 is already a boundary when we only look at the chain complex generated by these uh, generators. And therefore, by the rule from before, the action of S8 has to be a lower end of a bar. Uh, another example is um, S4. If you look at the boundary of S4, you get S3, S3 plus S7. And this is not a boundary when you restrict to filtration below S4. And in particular, the action of S4 has to be a, an upper end of a bar. So um, this gives you some properties of the barcode, but it doesn't define the barcode because I didn't tell you which lower ends of the bars go to which upper ends of the bars. But at the moment, I, I'd like to leave it at this and continue with the invariance that we extract from the barcode. So we have this barcode and we extract some uh, real numbers from it. One of it is the spectral metric, gamma of LN prime. This is precisely the difference of the endpoints of the two infinite bars. And then we also have the length of the finite bars, which I call beta one, beta two, up to beta k. Beta one is the length of the longest bar. This is also well known under the name of uh, boundary depth. But I also keep track of the length of the smaller bars. Now, all these invariants uh, satisfy some stability properties. Uh, they were introduced or at least applied to symplectic geometry by Polterovich Luchin around 2014. And here is a, a list. So first of all, the, all those invariants are lower bounds of Hofus metric. And moreover, the boundaries depth or also all the length of the finite bars are lower bounds of the spectral metric. And this is a result by Kisler Cheluchin around two, 2018. Uh, the, the, the two other uh, inequalities are just different uh, viewpoints on the same stability properties. If you introduce a third Lagrangian, L double prime, you can compare the invariance for the pair L and L prime and for the pair L and L double prime. And their difference is bounded above by the Hofer distance between L prime and L double prime. And the same for the beta J. So as you see here, all the invariants we get are lower bounds of Hofer's metric, and we will be interested into an opposite inequality. So here's the main result. Um, as I said, we restrict the tension to Lagrangians, which are Hamiltonian isotopic to the zero section in the cylinder, and we assume that they intersect transversely in two endpoints. Then the Hofer distance between L and L prime is bounded by the sum over j, 2 to the j, boundary, de boundary depth or other length of finite bars, plus gamma. So it's like a sum of all the invariants introduced, but there are weights, 2 to the j, depending on whether you take the, the longest bar or the second longest bar, etc. And as a corollary from this, the Hofer's distance between L and L prime is bounded by two to the N times the spectral metric of L L prime. And this just follows because the betas are a smaller equal than the spectral metric. And so if you um, just bound it, you get this sum of over two to the J plus one and, and you get two to the N. So it's geometric series. Okay, let's consider some consequences of this last inequality here. And for this, we consider a sequence LK. It's a sequence of Lagrangians that are 
all Hamiltonian as the topic to the zero section, and they should also tr intersect the zero section transversely. So this is just a sequence of Lagrangians that satisfy all the assumptions we had, have made before. Then we can consider unbounded sequences. So let us assume that Hofer's distance between L0 and LK explodes to infinity as K goes to infinity. Such sequences exist. This is a result by Haneski in 2009. And he also proved that whenever you have such an unbounded sequence, also the number of intersection points has to go to infinity. So this is like an old result, but we can recover it uh, from the inequality above because gamma, the spectral metric, is known to be bounded by a result uh, from Shiluchin, 2018. So gamma is always bounded. And then if in, in order to um, have that over distance explodes, you need that the number of intersection point, points goes to infinity. Um, we can also consider its relation to C0 symplectic topology. So suppose that the sequence of the number of intersection points is bounded. And suppose you have that the LK C0 converge to L0. Then it follows that the LKs converge in Hofer's metric to L0. So why is this? It is known that gamma, the spectral metric, is C0 continuous. So if, if you have that LK C0 converges to L0, it means that the spectral metric converges to 0. And if you assume that the number of intersection points stays bounded, it also means that this upper bound tends to 0. And therefore also Hofer's uh, distance between L0 and LK will tend to zero. So you get convergence in Hofer's metric. Okay, now I would like to say a few words about the proof. So we still are in the situation that L and L prime intersect transversely in two end points. And so we will apply induction on N. The case n equals one is just a direct calculation that I omit here. Um, therefore, we assume that we have at least n, at least two, which means that we have at least four intersection points. If you have four intersection points, you also have at least one finite bar. And so you can, um, you can consider the smallest finite bar in the bar code. It will always be of the form action of some intersection point up to some action of another intersection point. And the main um, proposition that you need is the following. There is always a strip from Q bar to P bar. And moreover, the strip is of minimal area. So for example, in this picture here, the um, strips from Q bar to P, P bar are um, colored in light blue. And these, these are strips of minimal area. Um, moreover, the area of the strip is exactly beta n minus one of LL prime. Beta n minus one of LL prime is exactly the length of the smallest bar just by definition. And we know that the length of the smallest bar is exactly the action difference between P bar and Q bar. And this has to be the area of the strip. So we found a strip whose area is like controlled. And moreover, it's a minimal strip, which means that we can try to remove those two intersection points, Q bar and P bar, by some small Hamiltonian diffeomorphism. This is the second step. 
we would like to remove the intersection points P bar and Q bar, in this case, for example, S3 and S4, which means that we construct a new Lagrangian L double prime, which is called here in red. And its Hofer, its Hofer distance to L prime should be bounded above by beta n minus one of L L prime. This can be achieved exactly because the area of this strip is beta n minus one of L L prime. So you can find um, a Hofer small Hamiltonian diffeomorphism um, up to some epsilon, which I ignore here. And you, you um, get some L double prime, which should still intersect transversely. But the important thing is that it has now two intersection points left. And this allows you to um, use induction later on. So here is step three. Step three applies stability to the pairs LL prime and LL double prime. So we see that the band that, that the betas and also the gammas for the pair LL prime and LL double prime, they are bounded by Hofer's distance between L prime and L double prime, which is again um, beta n minus one of LL prime. And all together. This um, enables you to do the following long inequality. You first take triangle inequality. So the distance between LL prime is bounded above by the distance between LL double prime and L double prime and L prime. For the first term, you apply induction. You get the result by induction. And the second term is bounded by this smallest bar. And now you, um, you, estimate all the terms that include some L double prime with terms that only include L and L prime by the stability properties before. And you collect all the terms and you will get the claim. You get this sum, this weighted sum over the beta chase and gamma. Yes, so that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Patricia. So again, a very nice talk. Um, any questions from the audience? I have a question. Um, so it seems that the like uh, two to the J coefficients come from the induction, right? Yes. Do exactly. you do you expect do you expect such growth growth in in the number of points, or do you think maybe the growth should be smaller or like, do you have any examples for? Um... Um, yes, that's a good question. I never expected it to be that bad, this these coefficients. And actually, this, this, uh, I tried to prove some better bounds, but I, I didn't. I mean, I couldn't prove a better bound. Um, but at the same time, I don't know any example that that is as, as bad as this bound. So actually, I. I expect that you can improve it in some way, but I don't know how. So my idea was to get a better control in this step here. So this is a, a kind of bad control. Um, you only get that the beta chase, each beta chase could actually change by this um, length of the smallest bar. And my hope was that if you if you take a, a good uh, Hamiltonian diffeomorphism, a good choice of L double prime, um, you might be able to show that not each of the beta J will change by as much as um, this quantity of as Hofer's distance. So I expected that some of the bars will get smaller and not all of them will get longer. Um, yes, and I can improve this bound, but I can all, only improve it in a way that doesn't help for induction. So that's the thing. <laughs> mm, I see. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I have a question. So thank you very much for this very nice lecture. Is uh, are there? I mean, the general also to the audience. Are there? Uh, 
similar type of examples that you can estimate in this way in higher dimensions. Yes, so the uh, way for example, I mean, uh, even uh, even in the case where you estimate spectral norms uh, for uh, um, symplectic maps in nice situations, and uh, if you can estimate just uh, usually so the norm I introduced uh, is bigger than uh, the, the spectral norms, but uh, here maybe there are relationships in the other directions which as you show in this dimension here, which are true uh, in higher dimensions. And I wonder if anybody ever looked at this or know some examples that there is actually a chance for this. Yes, so I also wonder about it. Um, the proof I give here for this two-dimensional example, it doesn't generalize, I think. So the first step should work in general, the, the smallest bar, always corresponds to some smallest strip but it's not clear to me how to remove how to use a smallest strip to um in order to remove two intersection points so i, I think this remove removing two intersection points is very two-dimensional so that's why this proof won't generalize easily to higher dimensions but I also wonder about any results or thoughts for higher dimensions. Yeah, yeah of course, higher dimensions is, of course, a technical nightmare. But maybe just to come up with some simple examples where there seems to be a pattern uh, might give some inspiration. So, um, if you, uh, so there is something that one can do, I think, <coughs> which is a little bit different. So, the thing is, um instead of counting bars in higher dimensions a possibility is to look at something a bit different so to look at the fukaya category and how many generators are needed suppose that the fukaya category has a finite number of generators and then you can count how many generators are needed to to um, generate a certain lagrangian and um, there is a way, I think, to uh, use this instead of counting bars. And because uh, the two things are related, in fact. So if you need to generate an object, a finite number of generators, then al also you can bound the general number of bars. Mm -hmm. So the generalization in higher dimensions, uh, I don't think it's so easy to do in terms of just of bars, because this argument that... Uh, you know, you eliminate uh, pairs of of intersection points. It uh, looks pretty specific in dimension two, but uh, there might be some other objects that you can count in. I think, uh, in any case, the, the, but I, do I, the lengths of bars with the Fukuya category? So, well, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, in, in this decomposition which you described, do you see numbers? Yes, yes, yes. So, so there in the you see the basic idea is that when you do uh, cones of so generating things in the Fukuya category means taking cones over some things, and when you do take cones, uh, you can control the number of bars. In fact, to through cones. In fact, it's something that I think appears also in a paper of yours with. Uh, yeah, this recent paper of yours with uh, Osia and uh, yeah, yeah. right. So okay, so so then that means that um, if you can generate objects with a finite number of bar of uh, generators, you have mm -hmm. a control of a number of bars, and so, but also the these generators control how how various Lagrangians intersect. No, my question they... was: What is analog of length of the bar? So here it's section difference, and in Fukuya category, it's what? Well, I mean, uh, the, the length of the bar uh, is embedded. I mean, you have to do all of this with filtration. So I see. OK, so you have this filtered version. As yes, well. so we have this filtered okay. version of the okay. whole Fukuya category. And in this filtered version, of course, lengths of bars appear, obviously. OK, OK, I see. Yeah, and, and in fact, it's also the cones come with weights so mm -hmm. in fact you do really really see the 
the lens there so yeah. it's not this is very cool <laughs> but but my, my only point was that in terms of counting besides counting intersection points or counting numbers of bars one good thing to count is generators in this uh, uh, Fukaya category in higher dimensions is very natural mm -hmm. and here you know when when you when you have these pictures that look like this you can say well the thing that looks like this starts to look like a fiber it's a small fiber but it's uh, you know it's uh, so it's not so far from mm -hmm. so you think one could fiber uh, for each intersection point one could reformulate what we just saw in the Fukaya category picture and then maybe it's well that's what I but what, then you have an obvious generalization that's what I'm saying, Helmut. So the, I'm saying that one could imagine that. And, you know. uh, I also have a question to Patricia, actually. So how did you calculate uh, the uh, floor complex from the picture? So what did you use? For so in order to calculate the floor complex, it was just looking at the picture, nothing more. Uh, but uh, uh, so are you telling that every strip uh, does so so what was your strip between s8 and i don't remember <laughs> s1 s1 or something so 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 uh, 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 it was not an embedded strip right so um so the strips between s1 and s8 they are both embedded they're are... embedded strips so one of those is just like this. I Can see. I... This? And, and the other strip is the one which follows this thin tube here, like this. All right. Uh, but uh, not every strip can be made holomorphic, right? Or, so, so, I mean, there should be some science or, about this. Um, yes. So, there are also inert strips which are not embedded. I'm uh -huh. not sure whether there is an example in this picture. Um, doesn't look like this, but I think in, in this example, you see a, an example of a strip which is not embedded. It has this area which is covered double. double. Uh -huh. um, yes, but yeah, I just looked at the picture. <laughs> I don't really understand what to explain here. But I think there was a paper by Dietmar and somebody who, who explained how to uh, calculate uh, Lagrangian floor homology in combinatorial uh, yes. way. Is it related? Yes, indeed. So this is all based on combinatorial floor theory by, I think it was Robin Salomon da Silva. Uh -huh. And they worked it out. They, they had a characterization for, for those strips in terms of their boundary behavior. So they somehow can characterize um, the existence of a strip between S1 and S5 by, by following the boundary and deciding whether there is a strip or not. Mm -hmm. Yes, there is a way to do this. I and think so, in concrete examples, it's, not, it's, it's easier to look at the picture. But to have a, a general theory that shows that all of these works, um, it, it, this is what they actually did so mm -hmm. and so this means that there is a kind of uh, finite algorithm at least on the cylinder to find upper bound for a hofer metric right so you can uh in, in principle at least write, write an algorithm which calculates this barcodes and then all these quantities yes indeed indeed uh -huh, which is quite remarkable actually yeah okay thank you Other questions? Right. So. Yeah. <laughs> okay, if there are no other questions, then we thank Patricia again. So thanks for the beautiful talk and thanks for also for the other speakers.